bit of orthopedics. Um, Izzy's doing the ortho bit. Oh yeah, thank you. I always forget about recording. Um, and there's a little bit of crossover in the middle. So I'm just going to start off with some heme um, with an SBA. So if people want to put in the chat um, what they think this might be. Or even if you have an idea of what the condition might be, if you don't necessarily know the answer, you can write some suggestions in. This is like a classic UCL two-step question. Yeah, where you need to like figure out the first part to be able to do the second bit. Anyone have any ideas? Should I just tell them? Should I tell you guys the answer? Um, okay, so what, oh, D, yeah, correct. Well done. It is, it's actually D. Do you know what condition this is I'm trying to go for here? Or any idea about what's happening? It is also possessive. Um, yeah, yeah, well done. It's sickle cell. Um, so this is basically. Obviously, we'll come on to all of this in a bit, but this is a vaso-occlusive crisis and it's probably like a kind of likely first presentation of someone with sickle cell, especially someone young um, present, might present this way. So um, the painful swollen hands and feet are called dactylitis. And in sickle cell patients, that happens in people that are under um, two years old. Yeah, sorry, it's a bit of a harsh one to start with. Um, but it's just like classic UCL doing a two step where you have to figure out the um, condition and then from there you uh, like then you need that knowledge to be able to answer the next bit. OK, so just a bit about sickle cell. So it's an autosomal recessive condition um, and it's more people more common in people of African descent. Um, and it's basically what happens is you get abnormal production of um, the HBS. Um, hemoglobin chain instead of HBA and I don't think you know to, need to know this level of detail but it's basically because um, of these this amino acid substitution at position six that causes that um, and essentially it basically the HBS abnormal chain that they produce it polymerizes when um, someone's deoxygenated and the blood cells deform and sickle and they basically block um, vessels and they can cause as a result, all these like different complications. So there's two different types. It's also recessive. So homozyg homozygotes, so HBSS, actually have sickle cell anemia. Um, and if you're AS, because A is a normal chain, then you've just got trait. Um, so that's what I just explained about how um, the pathology of it, what happens. Basically, it, it's just when someone's deoxygenated, the cells change shape and they block vessels and they can cause infarction, essentially. Um, so does anyone know you symptomatic if you have trait? So if you're a heterozygote. You just take a guess. So, um, so you are generally asymptomatic if you have trait. But basically, if if they are in situations where they become hypoxic, they get symptomatic sickling. So basically, someone un going on undergoing anesthesia um, can get symptomatic, if, even if they're just trait. Or if they're in an aircraft that becomes unpressurized um, and the environment's hypoxic, then they get it's called symptomatic sickling. But on the whole, they're fine. So if you're um, basically someone of African descent and before and they're about to go into an operation where they need an, like general anesthesia, you need to do a pre-op sickle cell test because they might, their um, blood cells might sickle during um, the operation. Um, and does anyone know what trait protects from classically? What disease you might be protected from if you've got sickle cell trait? Um, Malaria, yeah, well done, exactly. It's a falciparum type malaria. 
Okay. So can anyone think of what kind of investigations you want to do? Just like anything you might want to do if you think someone's got sickle cell because these bloods or whatever it is will be abnormal. I don't know why this keeps buzzing every time someone... Oh, there you go. Um, yes, you can do a blood fill. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. Anything else? What kind of, what might be the first thing you think to do in someone that you think has got sickle cell anemia? Like what's definitely going to be abnormal? Um, what we say, full blood count, exactly. So um, obviously their um, hemoglobin is going to be low. Um, so I'll just go through some things. I actually haven't put blood film on here, but that's a really good suggestion. And I do have a picture of a blood film later. So their hemoglobin is quite um, low. It's only 60 to 90. And the reticular sites are raised. Does anyone know um, kind of what a reticular site is or why that might be raised in a sickle cell patient? Or if you just know what a particular site is. Um, yeah, so reticular sites, yeah, exactly. They're immature red blood cells. So in sickle cell patients, because they've got these abnormal sickle cells, they're getting destroyed. So basically the bone marrow compensates for the um, reduction in the normal red blood cells by, it just basically tries to produce loads more. So that's why you get raised immature red blood sites. Um, bilirubin gets raised because the sickle cells are getting um, destroyed and hemolyzed and that re that releases bilirubin. Um, so you can do something called a sickle solubility test and they will be positive for that, but it won't distinguish if someone's got trait or if they've got actual anemia. Um, does anyone know what like the gold standard um, investigation is for sickle cell to confirm? And it can distinguish between the states. Don't worry if you don't, but does anyone know what that might be? Um, so yeah, you can, you do, you'll have along the right lines in the sense that you do screening in the UK, but it's, um, yeah, basically it, it's hemoglobin electrophoresis. So you, um, do electrophoresis of that, um, of the hemoglobin basically, and it will show, that will show you what, um, it, it's like the most certain way of diagnosing them. And it also will tell you if they've got trait or if they've, um, actually got, um, sickle cell. Um, and essentially also in the UK, I'm sure you guys have heard of the gut through test, maybe, maybe not, but there's this, um, they call it now neonatal blood spot screening and it happens in like the first kind of week of life. And in the UK, all babies are screened for sickle. Um, and I think, I mean, you don't need to know this, but I think if you're younger than one and you've recently moved to the UK, then you also will get screened for it. Um, you should be offered testing for it. Okay, so also like someone said the blood screen, um, blood fit, I'm sorry, which is a good idea. So can anyone tell me what any of these arrows are pointing to? You don't have to say what, um, describe which one is which, because it's kind of hard to say, but like, does anyone know what any of these cells are that the arrows are pointing to? Like the name of them? This is kind of like a classic sickle cell blood film, or it's got like most of the things that might come up. I mean, one of them is literally in the name. <laughs> Two of them are in the name, actually. So, target cell, yeah, great, yeah. So that's the um, the target cell with the dashed arrow, um, bottom left. That's really good. Um, anyone know what the cell, the bottom right arrow is, the one with the dot in it, is called? This is a bit more difficult. Okay, don't worry if not. So I'm just going to show you what they are. So those two are sickle cells. They just look kind of long and thin rather than like a normal round um, red blood cell. And that is called a Howell Jolly body. So basically you get Howell Jolly bodies if you have a damaged spleen or if you don't have a spleen because normal healthy spleens would filter this type of um, blood cell out of the body. So you wouldn't see it on a film normally. But obviously sickle cell patients, they do have they, their spleen kind of gets smaller and um, not very effective and that's why they don't filter out these cells so the ones with the dots in are how jolly bodies and yeah like you said that's target cell 
and um, the, sickle, the sickled cell, so the deformed red blood cell. Um, so can anyone think of any complications you might get from sickle cell anemia, literally anything? It's quite a few, like it affects a lot more than I think I remember when I learned it, it affects so much more than I thought it would. Yes, you get sickle cell crisis, which we'll come on to, that's good. Yeah, that's that's an example of one of the types of crisis. Well done. Um, do you know what kind of like organs might be damaged if you've got sickle cell anemia? Yeah. Um, let me have. Yeah, so yeah, good. So um, exactly. So I've, I've just put these onto the page and we can go through them. So splenic infarction, um, exactly. And what happens if, what I mean, what does the spleen do? What is going to happen if your spleen isn't working properly? Yeah, target cells come up in like a bunch of different um, heme conditions. You'll come up, when you, do, when you do all of heme, you'll come across, there's like quite a few that have target cells on the film. Um, but does anyone know what you're going to be at risk of if you've got a spleen that's not working properly? Exactly, infection. So the spleen normally um, dam like it destroys encapsulated organisms. So if you don't have a working spleen, you're going to be at risk of infection by those types of organisms. So that's things like strep pneumo, um, haemophilus is also a type of um, encapsulated organism which you're going to be at risk of. Um, you can get things like avascular necrosis of the femoral head because they um, because of prolonged ischemia, like they're not getting enough proper red blood cells. Um, renal, um, renal failure, so there's a thing called papillary necrosis, it's just a lot of it is basically infarction because obviously if you're if all your red blood cells are getting damaged then so many organs are going to be affected by that because they're not going to get a proper blood supply. Um, does anyone know why we're, we're going to get gall gallstones? This was um, one of the investigations basically is the answer to this, it's why you're going to have gallstones. What do we have increased amounts of in the blood and um, sickle cell anemia that is going to form gallstones? Anyone that's done mobia? Yeah, exactly. Increased blood Well done. Yeah, well done. Um, yeah, so that's going to cause gallstones. Chronic pain. So, like, obviously the crisis, which you guys mentioned, are really, really painful. But apparently sickle cell patients have reported just, like, pain unrelated to crisis. So it's a really difficult condition to manage. Um, and you can get iron overload if they're getting excessive um, blood transfusions. And then you can, nowadays they use iron chelators, so they kind of like group all the iron together um, to stop that from happening. And also another one is lung damage, you get hypoxia, and then they can get fibrosis of the lungs because of that. And as a result, you can get pulmonary hypertension. So quite a few sickle patients will have pulmonary hypertension. Okay, that was really good. Um, I've got another SBA for you. This is kind of like, I think if you've not done this, you won't know the answer, so don't worry, but it is, just have a stab at it if anyone knows, this is kind of hard. If you've done a bit of past mode, you'll probably know this. This is literally like the most past mode I've had. Yeah, yeah, well done. It is the it's parvovirus. Um, so do you know what? Just so this is a crisis. Um, what this SBA is describing. Does anyone know what type of crisis this is? I'll be impressed if you do. Don't worry if if not. Yeah, well done. Exactly. So this is yeah, classic SBA, classic past med. Basically, if you have someone that comes in, probably would known sickle cell, and they have a sudden really big drop in um, their hemoglobin. So like their hemoglobin there is incredibly low, it's 20, and they've got symptomatic anemia. So, you know, they're fatigued, they're really pale, they're tachycardic, they've not got enough circulating um, red blood cells. That's called an aplastic crisis, and the cause of agent is part of virus B19. Okay, so I think some of you, you've mentioned some of the types of crisis. Does anyone, can people just name some of the types of crisis or anything you know about any of the crises? I'm looking for four different types. Well, we've named aplastic and we've, someone named a um, sequestration crisis. There's 
two others. I think I named one already. Anyone know the different types? Nope. Okay, so, oh, yeah. <laughs> if anyone gets that from Izzy's clue. <laughs> um, yeah, base of occlusive, well done. That's, that's the third one. Okay, so I'll just give you all four. The other one is acute chest syndrome. Um, so these are all four of the crises. The next slide is quite, it's quite a lot of text, but I've just tried to put on there. I think that's literally like basically everything you need to know about the types of crisis. And I've just highlighted some kind of important things. So basically, so crisis are kind of like the classic. They're in severe pain. It was what my first SBA was. Um, and it's triggered by things like someone being in the cold for too long, an infection. Um, and oh, I think it's under three um, is you get dactylitis. So they get really swollen, painful hands and feet um, like babies. Um, and because you can get ischemia of the gut, you can have someone presenting in a vaso crisis as if like it's an acute abdomen situation. But the underlying thing might actually be they've got sickle cell and they're in a crisis there. So you need to keep that in mind. Um, so like if they get CNS and fortune, you're obviously going to get things like stroke and seizures. And like I mentioned before, one of the um, complications is avascular necrosis. So I think vaso if you just think the whole point is that the um, blood supply to some organ or something is getting cut off because the sickle cells are getting trapped in the vessels. And then you can just kind of think through different organs and think, well, how is that going to affect this area? Like if you've got no blood supply to the gut, you're going to have an acute abdomen where they're present they're in a lot of pain. And if they've got if you've got no blood supply to the brain, then things like stroke can happen. Um, so it seems like a lot of random stuff, but just try and think through that kind of logically. Um, a plastic crisis, I think, just remember it's part of a virus B19. It's like what I what that SBA was. So sudden reduction in um, their hemoglobin. And it usually is self-limiting, but if it's really severe, they might need a blood transfusion. Um, and then sequestration crisis. So that normally happens in younger people. And basically you just get loads of blood pooling in the spleen and liver. So they get enlarged, they get splenomegaly and hepatomegaly. And this is really like urgent. They're basically, they present in shock essentially um, because the blood is just pooling in these organs and not um, circulating. And so you need to urgently transfuse them. Um, and then acute chest syndrome is kind of being a bit vague, but it's like they'll probably have a fever, they'll be in a lot of pain, like it's common with all these crises. Um, they might have a cough, um, they'll be breathing really fast and their PO2 is gonna be low. So for that, the main thing is you give them kind of like what you'd expect, you give them painkillers, oxygen, antibiotics. Okay, so there's kind of like a general management of sickle cell um, crises. So can anyone think of like the kind of things, doesn't have to be in order, but like what kind of things are you gonna wanna deal with in general if someone comes in and they're in a sickle cell crisis? Kind of like thinking of like A to E or like things like that, what kind of things do you want to manage? So like they're in a lot of pain, for example, what are you gonna? Yeah, exactly, oxygen, well done. Yeah, pain relief, analgesia is really important. Um, if someone's shocked, what are you gonna wanna give them? Just like, like you would at, at any point, at any time if someone's in shock. Fluids, yeah, well done. And then if there's signs of infections, what might you, sign of infection, like they've got raised temperature, um, they just generally seem really unwell. What might you give them to cover for that? You're gonna give, uh, yeah, broad spectrum antibiotics, well done. So that's basically anything. So you give them IV opiates because they're in a lot of pain normally. And actually a lot of sickle cell patients have their own personalized um, pain management plan. Like, like they know how what to do to best deal with their crisis. Um, and then if things are really severe, like with sequestration crisis, what normally happens, they might need a blood transfusion if their HB is super low. Um, does anyone know what an exchange transfusion is? Like what, what, what that involves?
okay don't worry if not essentially you yeah exactly you remove um the patient's blood and stages and just completely replace it and that's when you're having a really severe crisis so um something like cns event like you think they might have had um a stroke or um if they're having seizures or if they basically their body is shutting down then you remove blood and just you basically completely replace it over a period of time um but that's quite when it's quite severe so generally it would be a blood transfusion if they've just got a low if they've just got a low hemoglobin okay so there's not like a huge amount of thing for long-term management but does anyone know any drugs or like or just anything you need to think of in a patient that has sickle cell like what you want might want to do long term for them kind of touched upon it before with the spleen becoming a bit useless in these patients. What kind of things are you going to want to protect them against? Or does anyone know what like the only curative thing is really for, for these patients? Anything? Yeah, so bone marrow transplant is the only curative thing, a stem cell transplant is, and that's generally only recommended for like for younger people um so yeah well done does anyone know what other kind of things you're going to want to do generally to manage these patients so thinking about the fact that their spleen is probably infarcted and not going to be working properly what might you want to do long term considering what we said about what the spleen is doing for these patients normally so perhaps a splenectomy but also, yeah, kind of alongside that prophylactic antibiotics, exactly. So does anyone know what antibiotic you actually give normally for these patients long term? Specific one. Don't worry if you don't know this. Um, just because it's effective against, um, more effective against encapsulated organisms. Nearly, it's penicillin. Um, and then if they're allergic to penicillin, you give them erythromycin. Um, so if I just show you. So the drug that you, if someone has frequent crisis, like as a child, you basically give them prophylactic hydroxyurea and they take that every day um, to, pre to prevent their crisis happening so regularly. Um, like you guys said, you give them prophylactic antibiotics, you give them penicillin, like just lifelong. Um, um, and you normally start that when they're a bit younger. And then obviously if they're penicillin allergic, you give them erythromycin. Um, and so immunizations is a really important thing as well, because these people are vulnerable because they're going to be so much more at risk of getting like all sorts of infections. So I've got a slide on the next page which shows you what kind of things they need to be immunised about. Um, genetic counselling. So if you've got a sickle, um, a woman of like childbearing age and they're thinking of, she's thinking of trying for a child or a man that wants to start a family, you, you need to talk to them about the fact that it's also so more recessive um, and the chances that if like their husband or wife is carrying it, like what that might mean for the child, etc. Um, you also um, give a lot of patients folic acid um, supplementation because um, there's loads of um, folate turnover because the blood has been constantly hemolyzed. So you just have to supplement it because they probably are going to be deficient otherwise. And then, like someone said, yeah, bone marrow or stem cell transplant is the only actual curative thing, but that's not offered to everyone. That's not like a standard thing. Um, so those are like the main things you need to know that you might give. Does anyone know what kind of um, immunizations you might give um, to sickle cell patients, children or adults? Um, to be honest, I don't think I kind of put this in for reference. I don't think you need to learn this like biblically, biblically, but these are the main immunizations that you give children and adults. So it's basically the immunizations that you're going to give people that are like over 65 or people that are quite vulnerable. You'll, you'll probably come across these immunizations quite a lot. Um, so like influenza, they need that. Hep B um, as a child. And then, I mean, you definitely don't need to worry about um, ACWI, but if they're going to high risk areas, they need to be vaccinated against that. Um, and so you just need to think about the fact that long term, basically just remember these patients are getting immunizations and they're getting antibiotics um if you just think about the fact the spleen's not working they're going to be susceptible to infection so what kind of things do you want um 
to protect them against long term. And then the only drug that you really need to remember is hydroxyurea or hydroxycarbamide, it's sometimes called. Um, and that's the one that they get given uh, prophylactically, basically, to prevent the incidence of crisis. Um, so that is all of that's all of my stuff on um, sickle cell. And then I think Izzy, you're going to do some ortho and a bit of crossover now. Um, I think you just. Um, um, in concluding, it's worth, worth, worth noting, worth noting that the new methodical vaccine every five years is worth learning. Is what? Is worth learning. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. Just the new methodical. Sorry, you're a bit echoey. I think he, so Anish said the one that definitely to keep in mind is the fact that they get pneumococcal every five years. Um, and maybe even influenza every year, but just, just because those are so such common um, vaccinations that you will come across them in other um, specialties as well. OK, yeah, but that's basically all me done. So Izzy, if you want to. Cool. cool. Um, um, starting off with a, um, an SBA. So this is a bit of an ortho sickle cell crossover. It's a very, very classic UCL SBA. Um, so you've got this young gentleman that comes in um, and he's complaining of this knee pain that's been, you know, aching, unremitting. He's now started to feel feverish and clammy and you do his blood pressure and it's a bit rubbish. So what kind of general stuff are we worried about in any patient that comes in with one really, really painful joint and they're not doing very well, basically? Um, sorry, my... Yeah, so septic arthritis is definitely up there and that is like the one that you want to rule out because it's going to be excruciatingly painful. It needs an orthopedic washout. Um, there's one that's kind of along those lines. So septic arthritis is an infection of the joint space. What else can be infected kind of around there? Yeah, so synovium, I think, kind of goes a bit, it would would get infected in septic arthritis, definitely, and get inflamed. But the big one as well is osteomyelitis, so that's a direct infection of the bone. And sickle cell patients are particularly vulnerable to this. Um, but other kind of things that you could still think about is that, you know, I think may pr probably in the absence of these infective features, um, just a bony crisis, and then also... Um, other things like cellulitis, you know, you want to have a look at that skin and see if it's red and inflamed. Um, but yeah, we're going to do our kind of sepsis six in this guy. Um, we want to give him some fluids um, and kind of proceed carefully. So I've put this in just because you're not going to get this in an SBA, but I think it's good to always visualize it, right? So this is some, these are some uh, x-rays of osteomyelitis of the knee so you can kind of see they get this initial breakdown of bone and then this reforming of it and it just looks it just doesn't reform properly and you get it almost looks like to me it looks like popcorn I wouldn't go calling it popcorn sign or something but to me it kind of looks all this craggy stuff um, and in children it's often of the long bones so they're femurs their arms, whereas in adults, you can you can get spinal ones um, and the joints are going to be a bit rubbish. So I've sort of highlighted them there for you just in case it helps to kind of visualize it. Um, and then there's a um, link to the, the case report if anyone's interested. Um, and then I've put this in because when you do ortho, they'll, they'll do MRIs in this patient and it's not going to come up in an SBA. But if you can see that part of the bone is just bright white that's kind of the infected area so if an ortho consultant asks you you can kind of point out that area and it just you know it just is a bit bit more interesting than a standard x-ray but don't worry you're literally not going to be expected to you know um for one in the exams the kind of main things with osteomyelitis and sickle cell is like it's more common in the kids than the adults um, but the main thing that will definitely come up in an SBA is if they say this is a young man with sickle cell and has osteomyelitis, what is the most causative, likely causative organism? It's salmonella. So for most individuals, it's in fact um, staph aureus, which is the most common, but kind of salmonella and sickle cell just go together. Um, 
And basically you get this, it travels from the gut to the bone. And because it's, you know, the bone is already damaged, it just kind of is just loving its life basically and just grows, has a bit of fun in the bone. Um, and obviously they're a bit immunosuppressed, as Divya was saying, they kind of lose their spleen. So this can be quite a devastating condition in these patients um, and they can become, you know, septic with it. So it is always good to consider, but it's a very like high yield exam question so bit of like return to year one bacteriology so can someone describe to me what salmonella looks like first so like what shape and what are these like stringy things arising from it these like hairs they're not hairs <laughs> can't come up with a better option but yeah can anyone describe to me like what they're called? Because you might get this in an SBA. It might be a sickle cell patient has a, you know, cause they give you like half the story. Um, yeah, yeah, so they'll be gram negative and then what shape are they? Yep, and they're flagellated, nice, nice. And yeah, bacilli, so they're rods. So that's something to bear in mind is that they've done it with us before where they've said, you know, a gram positive coccus has been isolated. And so it's always a good one to think about. Um, and so there's two other salmonellas that probably learn like as you go, but they're the ones for like typhoid, basically. It's another, we'll do it another time, but just be aware of there is a probably like two other salmonellas you need to be aware of, but yeah, cool. And then, yeah, as I've said, if it's a normal patient with osteomyelitis, the most common is staph aureus that similarly go infections like cellulitis. Um, staff is kind of the one, it's definitely not a one hit wonder, like it, you know, it does it all basically. Um, what I would say is that like as classic UCL SBAs do get you into that mindset where you kind of look for stereotypes, you know, if someone comes from Asia, they've got TB or everything is a consequence of their, um, of their genetic condition or whatever. And I think in real life, like you can't allow yourself to kind of get um, co to compartmentalize people, you know, like individuals with genetic conditions can have UTIs, they can have STIs, they can have whatever. And it's, you know, it's always important to take a step back and not miss something that's quite major. So, you know, what are some of the other causes? So I've got here a 35 year old man with sickle cell presents with wrist pain. So what are some common broad categories of wrist pain in individuals? And you can be as basic as you want, like. Yeah, so OA, you know, if they've been a mechanic and you know, they've had a job where they've been using it, they're a musician, they could have an overuse injury. Oh, VOC. What is VOC? Sorry, I'm like terrible with acronyms. What's VOC? Oh yeah, so yeah, they could have a vaso-occlusive crisis, but like aside from the um, aside from the sickle cells, they could for sure have a vaso-occlusive. But what sort of more run of the mill? I mean, what some of the classic causes of wrist pain? You know, you'll get four a night in A and E. You'll get them. Um, especially on a Saturday night when someone's had a few too many drinks. Yes, yeah, so they've fallen over, they fractured. Um, someone's just kind of sprained it. Like that's a kind of another shout. Um, and then you've got other things. So someone's, I think you can probably get slight dislocation would be a bit weird, mind you. Mind you, it'd probably go in combination with a fracture, but you know, there are other alternatives you've got your osteomyelitis which I've already talked about your arthritis which has been mentioned and also a good separate one is less mechanical but neurological so a lot of people come in with um like carpal tunnel syndrome with nerve palsies you know um what is it like Saturday night palsy where they fall asleep after too many drinks and you know get a uh, nerve injury so it's always something to think about and that's where like the history really comes into it and the nature of the pain really comes into it. And then you've got, yeah, especially your timelines, right? So some of these are going to have shorter times and some of these are going to have longer times. Okay, so a bit more onto orthopedics. So normal first. Um, just if you're looking at the image straight on, left and the right, which one's the ulna, which one's the radius? So 
So what's the big what's the big big bone of the forearm in that image? Radius on the right. So no, it's the it's the other way around. It's kind of like it's quite no. Oh yeah, yeah, left. Yeah, yeah, nice. So the radius is bigger, kind of more distally, and then the ulna has like the big olecranon on proximally. And to be honest, I think if you can just get these basics down of just knowing what the, what some of the bones are, like you'll do fine. So you've got your distal radius, you've got your distal ulna, they're nicely sat together um, and communicating. And then you've got your carpals, your metacarpals, and above your phalanges. So there's also your carpal bones, which I'm not going to go through. Um, but some of them really do come up, like the scaphoid is a classic one. Um, some other weird and wonderful ones you can get, you know, um, you can get problems with the lunate as well. But generally, like the the scaphoid is a good one to learn because it's quite comes up quite a lot clinically. So I think when approaching an X-ray, and it is very difficult when you're in an orthopedic meeting and the screen is at the other side of the room and it's a tiny screen and they're like, "Where's the fracture?" and you're like, "Well, I can't see it." Um, so my kind of top tips would be there might be a massive pathology but that doesn't mean you shouldn't look for other things. So they could, you know, have fractured their wrist and have a hairline fracture of, you know, their thumb or fractured their scaphoid as well. So it is good to check. Um, and I go around and trace the outlines of the bones um, if I'm unsure in something subtle, because if there's a break in the continuity, that often indicates a fracture. And then just observe like the angles that things are communicating um, to understand if there's been a dislocation um of the joints and the classic thing that they'll want is a lateral view of something so if you're not sure on the ap view ask to see the lateral and it can make things clearer so um so let's start with the one on the left so this is the same thing it's just two views so which bone is broken I mean, some of you whizzers like might already know what this is, but these are like two really classic things for SBAs. Yeah, disruption of the periosteum. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. But yeah, which bone is broken? It's kind of a fifty-fifty. You know, is it the radius or is it the ulna? Um, so to be fair, the ulna does look broken in the lateral. But if you look at it and it's the smaller bone in the AP view, can you kind of see how it's quite continuous with itself, but it's just in the wrong place? So and I think the lateral really shows it that it is literally like dislocated and it's just gone like to the side. Does that kind of make sense? So the ulna is dislocated and that's just kind of flown off but it's the radius that's been fractured and it's a displaced fracture. So that isn't going to heal on its own and will require some form of intervention. And so if any of you have done pars med, there's a kind of classic like name for this, which is a fracture of the radius with a dislocation of the ulna radial joint. Does anyone know what it's called? I don't know like where, where the name comes from. It's quite a nice name, someone's name. But like, don't worry, because it. I'm going to teach you the top tip about how to remember these. OK, so this is a Galeazzi fracture. So this is the distal third of the radius is fractured. And um, a hashtag, by the way, is a fracture that like literally sometimes you just don't clock it. But don't say hashtag, it's a fracture. It's just the shorthand. Um, and then you've got the dislocation of the radial ulna joint. So it's partner in crime is the one on the right. So which bone is fractured in this case? They are kind of just the reverse of each other. So it's kind of a more proximal break. I'm sure you're all like looking at it and you you know which one it is. Um, but basically, Sophie, you'd be right if you were answering for this one. So it's a 
fracture of the ulna proximally and then if I'd given you a different view the radius is kind of just like being displaced so this is the Montegia fracture so these two kind of go hand in hand and this is the proximal third of the ulna is fractured with a dislocation of the radius so it's literally flipped is how I think remember these two as a pair and the good way that PassMed helped me remember this is that like I remember it as Galaxy Rovers and Manchester United so in Galeazzi fractures it's the radius that's fractured with the ulna dislocating and for Montegia's um, it's the ulna that's fractured with the radial ulna joint dislocated so they're kind of two halves of the same thing kind of it's sort of no that's not true but <laughs> they are very similar and I think once you you've seen it a few times and I would I think just have a look at lots of photos um this is kind of quite a classic SBA one um so onwards and upwards so what have we got so um the orthopods love this um it's talking about the displacement of a fracture so as you can see, it might not be very clear. They've literally, this is someone that's fallen on their wrist and they've fractured both the radius and the ulna. And so you always want to comment first on the displacement of the distal element. So in this case, it's which way the hand has gone. So has it gone volally this way, so like that? Or has it gone dorsally the other way, like that? So in this case, which way has the hand gone? Has it gone volally or has it gone dorsally? So I, I used to get really confused with this. So if you look at the hand and if you look at the kind of bit that's broken off, and I think the best image to show this is the left hand side one, the lateral. Can you see that the, the hand has gone this way? Does that kind of, it's quite difficult to be honest to kind of do it over teams. I think it's much easier in real life, but it's basically gone dorsally. So the hand has shifted almost to the, you know, it's going the back back that way so it's dorsal displacement and I think to be honest if I'd given you the mechanism of this injury it would have made a lot of sense so this is classically um what's known as a collie's fracture so it's an, usually an a person that's fallen on an outstretched hand which is called fushing so if you fall on your outstretched hand you're going to push your hand up you're going to fracture this and your hand is just going to go like that, basically. Does that kind of make sense? Like, I hope it does. Um, and this classically occurs, um, if any of you have done orthopedics yet, in sort of elderly women with a history of osteoporosis. Um, and it is something that really should be, you know, fixed, but also pr prevention of another one is kind of a massive thing. So... Um, does anyone know how we treat osteoporosis? What sort of group of drugs? It's quite a good one to know for ortho and rumor like. You probably will have like seen people on these quite often. Yeah, so it's bisphosphonates. Yeah, fantastic. So they basically reduce the um osteoclasts that break down bone and it just keeps bone formation up so this is very common it's very common that people that have been on steroids for a long time have had this as well because steroids just ruin your bone density so yeah fab jordan um cool so and the classic with collie's fracture is you can see it quite clear i think a bit more clearly in these ones is that you get this dinner fork deformity so they fall on their outstretched hand and the hand gets sort of pushed up and it just looks like this. And the idea of it actually makes me cringe. Um, cool. So like we've done Galeazzi and Montegia, probably not saying those right at all. Um, Collies has a partner in crime. So an opposite. And this is classically someone falling on the kind of with their hand flexed. So they fall. And for this one, which way has the... Which way has it moved? So 
is it the distal parts of the hand? Has the hand moved dorsally or volally? I think sometimes you honestly have to imagine yourself doing it and which way your hand's going to go. Um, so if the back of your hand hits, hits the floor, which way is your hand going to go? Yeah, I used to do this in the exams. It's a good it's a good way to learn it. I think it contextualizes it quite nicely. So I mean if Collies is dorsal, then this one is going to be volar. So if everyone's looking at this, we can see that there's a fracture of the radius and the ulna. And I've got hold on one second. So what I, I'm kind of illustrating here is what I do is that I kind of almost do an outline of the bones and you can just see how like weird those look. And it's because they've just been fractured and displaced. And then on the lateral view, that hand has been pushed volally. Um, and this is called a Smith's fracture. So Collies and Smith's, Montegia and Galeazzi are kind of your classic wrist fractures to know. And yeah, it's falling on a flexed wrist, which to me has never seemed, I'm sure there is a reason why one would fall on a flex wrist, but it doesn't come as naturally as fushing and doesn't sound as cool as fushing. Um, and this is a classic um, dinner, uh, it's not a dinner fork deformity. And this upsets me as a name. So it's called a garden spade deformity, but they always give you a photo of a trowel. So, but maybe trowel deformity doesn't sound as good, but you can see how the, um, the hand has essentially been pushed down into almost like, you know, the palmer direction, the volar direction. So again, that's fairly unnerving. I think it would make me kind of cringe if I saw that in any. &E. Um, so let's say we've got this 35 year old gentleman who is diagnosed with a Galeazzi fracture. So he's um, fractured his radius, dislocated his ulna radial joint, and you've put it in a plaster cast, you think you've absolutely nailed it, you know, you've done a fabulous job, the plaster cast looks excellent. But he returns six hours later and you're a bit surprised to see him. And he's complaining of extreme agony in that arm. Does anyone know what's going on? And now I think that the clue would be if any of you have been on vascular, they make quite a thing of this. And often it's the leg that they mention. Um, yeah, honestly, you should go do a plus cast. It's actually kind of satisfying. It's, um, yeah. But yeah, kind of, what would be the first thing if he comes in with a plastered arm and the arm's really hurting? What's the first sort of thing you should do? And this is a classic SBA question. And this is something that you should, you have to, rec you're expected to recognise as an F1 because it's so dangerous. Yeah, so yeah, compartment syndrome is like your top. Yeah, yeah, it can literally happen. If So this is what I'm kind of getting at is that you've put this, you may have done, you know, the most excellent job, but if that cast is too tight, you're going to cut that blood supply off and it doesn't take long for them to start becoming symptomatic. And a limb can only survive a certain number of hours. Um, I think maybe if Anusha or Divya looks it up for me, I thought it was 12 hours. It depends on the body part, but I think, you know, the fact that he's coming in, in agony, you're going to want to take that plaster cast off because it could be something else, but like you do, you want to rule out your, your beautiful cast that you've done so well. And it's, it'll probably be quite a sad, sad moment, but you don't want to risk the compartment syndrome. So compartment syndrome is a true orthopedic emergency. It's classically following fractures, including a tibial shaft fracture in the leg. But it can happen with minor trauma. So you should never rule it out. Uh, even, you know, if you're thinking, actually, they've not had much damage. It can just happen. Um, and it's basically this increased pressure within the compartment. And the way that your arterial and venous system works is that they go from the blood flows from high pressure to low pressure and if they're in this tight compact compartment there's just no pressure difference 
And so you get this rubbish venous drainage and all the fluid goes from the um, venous system into the tissues and you get this dilation and it can cause the muscle to die. You release all this, you know, all these toxins, all this myoglobin, which can knack your kidneys and people do die of this especially things like thigh compartment syndrome that's left like people do die of this and people can lose limbs so it's always very like you want to re-establish that blood supply really quickly and um the way they do this is by an urgent fasciotomy which like low-key you're not going to do at the bedside you're going to get like this you know get them into theater but this is the marking out of one in the arm the leg is slightly different it's kind of like three or four incisions i wouldn't go and you don't need to learn the incisions, but you just need to know that what you want to do is take that cast off. And what you want to do is just like raise this really quickly because in a few hours they're going to lose this limb. So there's, I would, I found this from a paper, but it's very, very similar to the six P's of acute limb ischemia. So if any of you have done vascular, if your limb is not getting enough blood supply, how is it going to look? Like, how is it going to feel? Does, I think just, even if you haven't done it, just think logically, you know, like if I tied a tourniquet around your arm and left it, what what would happen? Oh, nice. Jordan has like got this, got this down. Right. Yeah. Nice, guys. Right. So paresthesia. So one of the first things they'll complain of is like this tingling in the arm. And yeah, they'll get pain and it might look kind of disproportionate. You might think like, is he having me on here? Like, but really it's agony. If you watch Grey's Anatomy, they always just get the scalpel out and just like cut it open immediately. Um, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. But yeah, pallor, paresthesia. Um, nice. I'm the one thing about pulselessness from what I've learned is interestingly, it's not a feature. And I think that's because you haven't really technically cut off the arterial supply. It's just that all the blood is just not returning back and the pressure is really high. So you shouldn't be reassured by a good pulse. Whereas in acute limb ischemia, often it's that they've got arterial disease and therefore they'll be pulseless. But also, you know, you should definitely still check their pulses, like for sure. Um, so, yeah, these were the the few that this paper had. So that's really good. Um, OK, moving on from compartment syndrome, we're doing some high yield emergencies. I'd say this isn't as much of an emergency, but it will be to your patient. So. There's this bloke that comes to see you. He's a 75 year old gentleman. He likes a bit of a party. He's gone out last night. He's had a huge banquet. He's had a few drinks, maybe some port, maybe it's Christmas. And he's presented to you with this sudden onset agonizing pain in, we'll go with his big toe, but it could easily be his hands or his ankle. But let's go with classically, this is the one they'll give you, is his big first toe, and it's red, it's angry, and he's just in a lot of pain. And he's got a past medical history of diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. Now, not everyone will present like this. I'm just giving you kind of all of the hints for this one. Um, but yeah, his drugs, he's on a thiazide, he's on a calcium channel blocker, and he's on a statin. So this would be unlikely to be the same patient, but he has the top picture, which is an angry, angry toe. Yeah, nice, nice. So we're thinking this is a bloke that's probably eaten quite a lot of meat. He's probably had quite a lot of wine or whatever he likes to drink. And he's on a few drugs, uh, on a drug that makes him more susceptible to gout. And he's got this classic agonizing for, like first toe thing and it is really bad. And yeah, so it's gout. Well done, Ravi, like well done. Do you know for bonus, bonus point, what these finger kind of nodules are called in gout. So they kind of look white, they can be a bit irregular, um, and there's kind of a classic word for it. This is something that like the rheumatologist will like love you for if you can name it. And you might see some like cracking, cracking hand signs and feet signs in gout. Begins with a T. Yeah, so it's tofi. Yeah, yeah, tofi. So they're called these like gouty tofi. 
is the classic sign. There is a sign, there's a specific name for the first toe being swollen, but I've utterly forgotten it and it's not necessary. Yeah, I was going to ask. What is, I can't remember what the sign is. Can you look it up for me? I know what it is. Oh, just totally forgotten. If someone knows it, put it in the chat. But we will like continue, continue on. But yeah, your risk factors for gout. So gout is an increased level of uric acid. So we're going to go on to drugs. But do you know for the moment any other kind of classic causes? I mean, I did, um, I did include a few. But yeah, there's a few drugs. Um, but essentially, you've got too much uric acid. So it's anything. So either you're taking too much uric acid in, and those classically are like your, um, sorry, urate. What am I talking about? Um, is an increase. Just basically, you're taking in too much. You're moving it all into your joints, or you're not excreting it. So for this, it's classically seafood has quite high content in um, any kind of organs, red meat. Your classics. Increased production. So all your red cells are. You can get it from hemolysis. You can get it in psoriatic arthritis. You can also get it when you've got high levels of red blood cells. So polycythemia can do it. Seen that in a patient and in rhabdomyolysis where you're just breaking down your cells. So there's a few things, but I think whenever you approach something, it's the same with iron deficiency anemia and stuff. Is it that the intake is high or low? Is it that it's all going to the wrong place or not being dealt with properly? Or is it just not being excreted properly? I think is quite a nice way to frame to frame certain conditions. And so reduced excretion is quite classically the medications and it's also renal impairment. So when someone's on an ACE inhibitor and um, and a few other things that makes you think a renal problem or they're diabetic, do definitely consider it um, as a source. Um, and then medications wise, it's thiazides are the big one, like the classic one for um, for um, exams, and it's because they just reduce the um, reduce the clearance. I can't. I don't think you need to know the specifics, but thiazides are quite a big culprit, and then um, a few of the others. But I wouldn't wouldn't worry like too much. It's more it's more commonly kind of lifestyle and genetic factors and a bit of renal failure. Um, does anyone know how we treat gout? There's two drugs. That you're kind of your options which is always nice there's not like a million um it's not as simple as like the rest of rheumatology which is steroids you can give steroids in like to reduce that inflammation but there's two drugs that are used to treat it one is actually on this slide actually i realize i've given given the game away yeah, so allopurinol, nice. Um, and then what's the other one? It begins with a C. And so yeah, the other drug begins with a C. So like, let me know if you if that raises any um, anything in your mind. But what's the key bit about allopurinol? What should you kind of not do? So if this guy's just presented, are you going to put him on all allopurinol? Yeah, so you don't do it in the acute setting. Um, oh, yeah. I put it on there. I'm an idiot. So um, you don't start it acutely. It literally makes it worse. They've had cases where people have been put on it in too early and it just causes even more gout because it just drives all that u uric like urate into the joint space. So don't do it. But the one that you do start acutely is colchicine. So um, that's the kind of, you do that in the acute setting and then you move to allopurinol as like a prophylaxis and prevention of future episodes. So if someone's on allopurinol, you know that they've probably had gout for a long time. If someone's on colchicine, you should probably ask them why there's a few other uses of colchicine, but it might be that they've had an acute gout flare. Um, the tie-in with this and sickle cell is that they can be a bit predisposed because they have hem increased hemolysis, but I wouldn't say it's like too much of a link. Um, I was being a bit, um, yeah, I was uh, 
make it a bit of a stretch. Um, Anish, did you want to say something? Yeah, I think it's worth pointing out actually the guidance has changed. So the majority of patients with gout will now just get treated with an NSAID like uh, naproxen or ibuprofen. Unless they have renal impairment, then they'll get colchicine. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So that's new guidance, relatively. Okay. Um, do you want to just write that in the chat just so that um, people have got it? Um, yeah, because, yeah, so if there's no um, contraindications for NSAIDs, use NSAIDs. They're cheap. They're wonderful. You can get them over the counter. If there's any kind of renal impairment, you're going to use colchicine, and then you're going to use allopurinol in the long term. So we've done a kind of whistle-stop tour of a few random um, – not, I don't think too random, but a few different pathologies. We've touched on some vascular medicine. We've touched on some orthopedics. We've touched on some rheumatology. So I think overall, like, history is the most important. Time scale is really good. Mechanism of injury, they're going to really ask you this stuff. And it's going to make a lot more sense. And if you're a visual learner, it's always good to think about the mechanism and which way the bones will have gone. I think be aware of diagnostic overshadowing. And SBAs, they kind of teach us this to do this but in real life other stuff happens people surprise you um and then emergencies to know for the limbs and these do come up very regularly compartment syndrome of course very time limited septic arthritis cellulitis osteomyelitis and they always do this they'll show you an ap view of something and they'll be like what do you want to do next and you'll say bloods or something which is totally what i've done and then they've gone you want to see the lateral view and that can really really help you so don't don't fear asking someone to show you the lateral or to get it up it can be really helpful cool so yeah thank you so much guys i hope that's been useful please put in the um give us any feedback we really really appreciate it super useful anything you guys want in future sessions we're going to do an end of end of term quiz on a few of the things we've covered plus some just random fun stuff so like feel free to join in that i think once we've made it we'll kind of post um some reminders about it um any feedback is good feedback so if anything hasn't worked for you if you want any changes like please let us know we've tried to add a few more sbas in so um we're always happy to get kind of feedback on those and on particular cases and what's what's worked and what hasn't so just go for it but otherwise like enjoy your evening have a good dinner all the rest of it um i don't know if anushin did you want to add anything <laughs>